Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Roberta Braga, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm sorry we're starting just a little bit late today. That rarely happens for us. Um, I'm an associate director here at the council, and I also have the honor of leading our Brazil work. Um, so again, welcome, and I hope you grabbed some admittedly non-Brazilian empanadas on your way in, but I promise they're very good. <laughs> I'm happy to be moderating today's conversation on uh, trade and foreign direct investment between the US and Brazil. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had a really great conversation on the Brazilian administration's first 100 days, but somehow we didn't spend that much time, time on US Brazil, and I don't know how we managed to do that. Um, so I'm compensating for that today by focusing strictly on the bilateral relationship um, and, of course, on business and commercial areas. So before we begin, I wanted to briefly set the scene for the conversation, and then I'll provide an introduction for our great group of speakers. Um, we're about two months into President Bolsonaro's term, um, and Brazilians have very high expectations at this point that Brazil will be able to meet its economic potential. Realistically, government deficit is very high still. Um, debt to GDP ratio hit 78% of GDP in 2018, which is the highest in almost a generation, you could say. But since October of last year, the stock market um, has gone up about 5%, which is a positive sign. And economic growth is forecasted above 2.2% in 2019 and 2.7% in 2020. And those numbers do paint a positive picture. There's clearly still a lot of work to be done. Um, we all know this very well. Just last week, the administration proposed um, a plan for pension reform, which now has to be approved by the Brazilian Congress. Um, but the new government's mission really doesn't end there. They'll have to address a host of other issues, including the tax code and reducing barriers to imports, which are both promises that the president made during the campaign cycle and something that we'll talk about extensively today. But of course, as Brazil works through these domestic reforms, um, they've also promised to strengthen the US-Brazil relationship, and that'll really open doors for uh, continued growth and prosperity. But it's how Brazil and the United States seize on those opportunities and what the relationship looks like on a pragmatic level that we'll be dissecting today. And so with that, I wanted to introduce our speakers, beginning with Murilo Jaragão who's joining us from Brazil here during a visit of only a few days. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Arco Advice, one of Brazil's leading political consulting co companies. He's also founding partner of the law firm Advocacia Bonito de Aragão. He's been a member of the Council of Social Economic Development of the Presidency of Brazil since 2017. And there he led the council's delegations on Russia, the BRICS, and the European Union. He's also helped foreign divest investors navigate the Brazilian political landscape, which we all know is no easy task sometimes. Um, and so with Murilo only here for a few days, we're very ha happy to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Next is Renata Vargas Amaral, founder and president of the Women Inside Trade Association, a group that focuses on influencing, strengthening the international trade community, both here in Washington and in Brazil. Renata is also the director of, the international, of international trade at Bahá'u M. Jorge and Associates, BMJ. She has an extensive record of successful engagement at WTO in bilateral trade negotiations, which are, are very relevant for today's conversations, and of course, domestic trade policy. She worked previously at the Ministry of Development, Industry, and Foreign Trade in the Brazilian Agency for Industrial Development in Brazil. Welcome, Renata. And then to my furthest left, Ambassador Anthony Harrington, chair of Albright Stonebridge Group's managing board, where he co-leads the Latin America practice as well. Um, ambassador Harrington was US ambassador to Brazil, and during his tenure, he carried out a mandate to upgrade the level, the level of the bilateral relationship, as well as um, interacting and leading uh, the conversation with the private sector in both countries. So of course, very well positioned to be uh, setting the scene for our conversation today. In recognition of his accomplishments, he was awarded the Hugh Branco Grand Cross by the government, a very prestigious honor. And so before we get started, of course, um, I also wanted to give you the uh, usual announcement for everyone following along online through live webcast. Today's hashtag is AC Brazil. Um, and with that, I'd like to get started by posing the first question to Renata and to Tony. Um, Brazil and the US, we've discussed, seem more aligned today than in recent history. And so with that and the president's scheduled vi visit in mid-March, I wanted to get a sense from you 
how do you think the momentum is going for strengthening of the bilateral relationship? And what do you foresee as being some key outcomes of the trip? This is also a question I'll pose to Modelo in a second. Okay. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think this is a very timely uh, discussion because Bolsonaro is supposed to be here in two or three weeks. Um, there is a lot of expectation of, uh, of the outcomes of the meeting, how it's going to, to what, what can we expect from this. I think uh, we can discuss it later, but we won't have a MOU for sure. And, uh, but uh, we know that the Brazilian uh, government uh, people are coming here with uh, a very um, high agenda on OECD. We know that, everybody knows that. Uh, uh, the US hasn't been uh, <laughs> supporting Brazilian membership at the OECD for the past years. Who uh, the, the experts here who follow the, the subject know that. Um, so this is gonna be a, a very important topic of the agenda. Uh, I don't think that we will have announcement of trade agreements, for example, between the US and Brazil. Maybe we'll have announcements of exploratory dialogues or things like this, uh, arrangements. But uh, also I'd like to point out that since uh, Dilma's second term, uh, the Brazilian government has been approaching the US, actually. We have more than 30 uh, bilateral dialogues between the US and Brazil going on, <laughs> technical dialogues. So I think bringing this all together now with uh, the current government of Brazil, we have a really important momentum for the negotiations. And uh, it's not uh, a coincidence that Bolsonaro chose the US to be its first international uh, visit. So this, yeah. um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to take a, just a few minutes to kind of retrospective uh, provides lessons for where we are and where we might go. Uh, happily, when I enjoyed serving as ambassador in Brazil, uh, it was a very good time under President Cardozo and uh, President Clinton here. Um, there was an exceptional focus on the bilateral relationship then, driven in large part by the f uh, simple fact that the Clintons and the Cardozos were each other's closest first family friends. and. Uh, when the idea of my going as an ambassador somewhere came up, both the president and the first lady kept pointing to Brazil. And I concluded, uh, A, it was an uh, overlooked relationship, and B, it might be more fun than Beijing. Uh, yeah. So um, there was a, an effort to upgrade the relationship, a very talented team there, quite a bit getting done, including uh, we signed the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, which has been used very much in recent times uh, for the cooperation and uh, prosecution of the Lavo Jato and related issues. Um, Lula, it was uh, interesting to watch his coming in, uh, where uh, even leaders of the business community, friends, uh, concluded they would support him to demonstrate that Brazil was open to uh, a broader spectrum of, of leadership. Um, I ended up speaking out publicly at the time because the markets were tanking and, and, and doing it uh, very excessively. He obviously benefited from a commodities boom. Uh, some colleague of mine refers to the fact that he surfed the wave in terms of uh, uh, the benefits of presiding over a, a booming economy. Um, the even though President Bush and uh, then President Obama liked Lula very much personally, uh, the agenda shifted to more of a South-South focus instead of a North-South and, and the U.S. focus. Um, uh, with uh, President Rousseff, uh, uh, I would say the tide went out um, and um, fiscal and economic uh, concerns, uh, the corruption surfacing and so forth uh, meant that there, there wasn't much room for the U.S.-Brazil uh, relationship on the agenda, um, and it, it further declined. Uh, even though Obama, I was with him, uh, went to visit uh, President Rousseff uh, even before she'd taken office, uh, as I recall, between the election and taking office. Um, 
Timur uh, sought to stem the tide uh, but, and accomplished quite a bit, but faced with uh, economic and fiscal challenges and lacking a popular mandate uh, limited how much uh, space there was for uh, focus on U advancing the U.S.-Brazil uh, agenda, even though it was a, it was a hospitable attitude. And then uh, President Bolsonaro, to me, represents a new tide. Uh, and it's a new tide for Brazil, but it's not just something you're seeing in, in Brazil. You're seeing uh, similar developments around the world. You might even say somewhat here. So the key thing to me is that, uh, you know, it's what is, what's the priority at the top, and President Bolsonaro and his team refer to seeking a, a new partnership or alliance between our two countries, which sets a pretty high level. Um, and the agenda of, of economy, security, anti-corruption, trade, innovation fits, fits pretty well. As far as the potential deliverables here, I, I agree uh, that we don't want to get too high in expectations for a first visit. Uh, probably there will be, and we'll talk more about this perhaps later, technology safeguards agreement might be concluded. Uh, a launching of, of more robust military and defense cooperation, a, and I agree with Hanata, there's not going to be a free trade agreement unless suddenly our president announces one to the surprise of everyone around him, um, uh, but uh, probably a deeper dialogue on trade will occur. OECD, we'll talk more about, I agree, uh, that's a, a uh, would be a work in progress, continued focus on uh, Venezuela, and uh, some talk about characterizing the relationship in a more robust way as some sort of non-NATO ally. Mm -hmm. Tony, thank you so much. I think you very aptly laid out the fact that Brazil and the United States have been allies for a very long time, uh, despite moments of tension. And so, Murilo, I turn back to you, not only okay. to add any thoughts you might have about the deliverables of the trip in mid-March, but also based on some of those lessons learned that Ambassador Harrington laid out, what do you see as some of the practic practical next steps being for the conversation between the two countries? Well, uh, I will try to be very specific, uh, and you ask here what could be different from the past in terms of deepening the relationship between Brazil and U.S. I think that the, the aspect that are more important is the fact that Brazil changed a lot in the last five years because car wash operation. And car wash operation had not only uh, political and legal repercussions, but also economic repercussions. Brazil today is a much more open economy for business, for foreign direct investments than it was in the past. All the opportunities that the government and the state-owned companies were giving to the champions of Brazil, the big contractors, as you know, now are open to all uh, in the world. So this makes a huge difference in terms of environment of investment in Brazil. Brazil is becoming much more transparent in terms of opportunities. Uh, we have also implemented an agenda of reforms uh, highly significant in the last two years. Three years, we changed the, the framework of the oil industry, energy, mining, uh, uh, outsourcing law, labor reform, uh, the state-owned uh, the, the state -owned responsibility law also. Uh, so this is shaping a new country, and the, the new government also is following the same path, and even more, they are doing more, they are trying to, to do more. So uh, actually, I believe that the most important aspect of the visit of Bolsonaro is to show uh, that we have now a different Brazil for investment. And also because we have a president who is much more aligned ideologically with the United States than ever in the recent years. So also this is very... Uh, uh, relevant for the relationship, and I'm highly optimistic, even considering that it's difficult to have deliverables mm -hmm. in such a short notice. You know, we are just starting a new era of dialogue. We have to understand that the, the relationship is not only diplomatic, it's financial, it's the investment, it's cultural. Mm -hmm. So all these areas we are doing very well in the relationship between Brazil and U.S. So I'm highly optimistic. I'm bullish about the visit. And I think that we are starting a new era in this relationship. I'd like to pose a follow-up question both to you and okay. to Renata as well. 
Um, Brazil has in the past been criticized for being very expensive to do business with, even by President Trump himself. Mm -hmm. um, and President Bolsonaro promised to address the barriers to entry for investment in Brazil during the campaign. And since then, he has proposed de-bureaucratization um, to open these new avenues for FDI. And so in what practical ways have we seen this material materialized? And on top of that, um, we've also seen some other proposals being, being suggested, including one to um, address corruption. And so how does this lay the groundwork then for these next steps that you brought up? Do you want me to go first? Okay. Uh, well, um, maybe we can divide that conversation a little bit, but uh, with regards to the anti-corruption measures that were announced uh, last week, um, from my perspective, they respond much more to the to a civil society demand than to the market. Uh, historically, uh, cor corruption has not much to do with the economy in Brazil, unfortunately, actually. Uh, so I think the anti-corruption measures, they, they, give, they are welcome, they give a good sign to the market, but they are not directly uh, related to uh, uh, change on the market perspective and business community in Brazil. That, that's my view. On the other hand, uh, if you talk about the pension reform, that was very welcomed by the market. Uh, and uh, that has a direct impact. Uh, because we are talking about savings. I don't believe that the government will be able to save one trillion uh, reais uh, in 10 years as it would like to, but if we have something about uh, 600 billion uh, reais or something like this, <laughs> and Andrea pointed out uh, very well this uh, last evening in another event we were discussing this, uh, I think this would be a, a nice, uh, good sign for the market. But the reform, the pension reform, although it was very positive in market senses, uh, it won't be approved in the pace the market would like to. Uh, the Congress and Bolsonaro actually has to form his basis in the, go in the Congress to pass the reform. We are still waiting for the military uh, inputs on that reform for, for civil um, <laughs> public servants also. <laughs> So we are going to have a lot of discussion still on this. Uh, so I believe it is, although it is a very good sign, the market wanted that. Although we have a civil society, more or less, uh, there is a consensus that we need that reform. Uh, but it's not that easy to pass in the Congress. We are already, if you see the news this week, you, there are a lot, of, a lot of discussion and interests that are coming up. And they, they are going to be, I don't know how the government is going to deal with it, because Bolsonaro, as you know, is, he doesn't have a, a, his formed basis. So it's, it's not that simple. Uh, so I believe we, we are, like, in another, another thing I'd like to point out, two, two more points, actually. I think Brazil was, has been historically uh, a country that attracts a lot of investment worldwide. And the US has been historically a, a great investor in Brazil. So this, uh, I think with this new government we have now, uh, this, the opportunities are going to be improved for foreign direct investment more than they are. But the, uh, we have something in Brazil that Roberta mentioned that it's really complicated the red tape and the costs of, of um, uh, ports and highways and uh, the, the, the Brazilian cost, the Custo Brasil, which is so famous, it's super high. And that has a lot to do also with the, te the tax reform that we won't discuss this year probably. It's going to be the second or third year of the government. It's not now because we have to pass the pension reform before. <laughs> so Brazil is... Um, uh, an attractor of foreign direct investment, an uh, inter interesting one for years, and it's going to be more open to business now with this government, that's for sure. We, we, we are ha seeing already a lot of announcements of public, uh, public partnerships, pu public-private partnerships. We have a minister of infrastructure, Tarcísio, uh, who is very for PPPs, public-private uh, partnerships, so this is good for foreign direct investment, foreign investors. Uh, and just one last point, uh, with regards to the liberalization, I think this government has this 
and it's very uh, it tries to signal this to the market and to the society very uh, strongly in every announcement they make we are liberals they, we have Paul Gadges on uh, the top of the liberal agenda but if uh, if you have trade exports here if you saw the anti-dumping of milk that happened last week in Brazil if you saw this this um, which is which affected the agro business actually which was a sector of Brazil that was highly uh, supporting bolsonaro <laughs> till now uh, so it it won't go going to, it is not going to be that easy to approve this liberal agenda as a whole so well, we can discuss that later, but a lot of, yeah. Uh, uh, Murilo, do you have anything to add to that as well? Yes, I, uh, first of all, about the anti-corruption uh, measures. Uh, well, we, uh, uh, because uh, the society in 2013, we approved an anti-corruption law that was the ground for the car wash operation. Mm -hmm. So this changed the landscape of Brazil in terms of fighting corruption. But also uh, we had, uh, the, the practice of compliance being very clear for Brazilian business and for the relationship between business and the government in Brazil. So these two aspects are really relevant in showing a new Brazil. People, uh, the business in Brazil <coughs> are uh, committed to follow the compliance rules and even following uh, a foreign legislation about that, such as the foreign corrupt uh, FCPA mm -hmm. and others uh, in the world. So these two aspects are very important and also society when express a deep desire for renovation and provoke the, a big renovation in the Congress is showing that we don't want any more corruption and we want a different behavior from the government and from the business. Um, this is the first aspect. The second <coughs> aspect is re in, in related to, to the concrete measures to reduce uh, the red tapes in Brazil. Uh, we, we see, uh, I, I see this as a process uh, in the last two years, we had uh, strong measures uh, against uh, red tapes in the agribusiness. Uh, it was implemented by Minister Blairo Maggi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I see this as a trend. Other, uh, other areas of the government are following. Uh, there's a commitment of Caio Megali, Carlos uh, Costa, and others to propose in the next months a series of measures to reduce red tapes <coughs> in Brazil, to make easy to, uh, for example, to pay taxes. In Brazil, we, we spend 2,200 hours per year to pay taxes. Uh, the target is to cut half of this time, which will be re remaining a, 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 a large, 1,000 hours will be a lot of time, but it's half of what it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, we will see the simplification of the tax system as a reform and in my opinion, it's more than a reform, it's a revolution. Uh, it's a silent re revolution and will be not easy because the corporatist mentality of the machinery of the government mm -hmm. resists to lose power. Uh, they hold the power of the bureaucracy to, to keep their uh, power to interfere in the life of citizens, to uh, bargain for wage increases and all, all other uh, aspects like that. So this will be a great battle of the new administration. Uh, and, uh, but I am very optimistic because it's matters that can be solved through decrees, it's not necessary to do laws or uh, <coughs> constitutional amendments. Uh, the, 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 the tax reform itself will be the second big battle in the Congress. Uh, it's necessary to consider the, the situation of the states that are really <coughs> poor. So they, they have to, to be helped to, to accept uh, a new framework for the for the tax system in Brazil. This will be not easy, but I believe that if we have success in uh, having economic growth and keeping the popularity of the president and being <laughs> successful in fighting corruption and increasing the quality of the public, public safety in Brazil, this will be possible to do. And finally about uh, the, the social security, uh, we are clear in the position to do a good reform. Uh, first of all, because everybody knows that it's necessary to do the reform. Uh, in, in, in ARCO advice, we recently did a, a, a survey in the Congress with 109 congressmen and the majority are supporting the Social Security. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure will be not uh, the ideal reform in terms of the market perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, we are not going to spare one trillion or two trillions 
Uh, when I say one trillion, remember Austin Powers uh, <laughs> approach to money. So one trillion, I don't know how much is one trillion, or if it will be one trillion two hundred or nine hundred million uh, billion. I what I expect is to have a better system for the future, and that's the major aspect that we need to tackle to implement new rules for the social security for the future. The past we will solve buying credibility, and buying credibility is looking ahead and saying that in the future the system will be perfect. Uh, so I am bullish in approving uh, uh, Social Security. It will be not easy for sure uh, because uh, we are going to see a, a kind of trade horse in the Congress. Yeah. Uh, the agenda, so uh, the caucus of uh, the Hero caucus wants an agenda, the Evangelical caucus wants other agendas, so it is necessary a lot of efficiency to coordinate all the yeah. agendas. But in the end of the day, what, I, what counts is the fact that the governors control one third of the benches at the Congress, and they are broke. They need the money of the Social Security. They are spending 90% of their revenues in wages and pensions. There's no money to, to do politics. So the, the Social Security is a necessity. So uh, b without the Social Security reform, uh, will be a chaotic situation for the states, especially for the states. So uh, even considering that will be a, a difficult task, also because we don't have the uh, clearly how will be the political base of the government, but I see uh, the disposition of the congressmen to approve a social security because they need the money to do politics. And finally, I, I want to add one thing. Uh, the, all the programs that we have in terms of PPPs, uh, privatization, uh, and direct investments in Brazil uh, are posing the possibility of us to receive more than $100 billion uh, in uh, foreign capital this year in Brazil. Speculative capital and direct investments. So it's a very positive sign, and Brazil will remain being the top five destination of FDIs in the world. Okay. I want to, um, based Roberta, on what could you I just said. add one sure, note? Uh, I think. The commitment to addressing the Custo de Brazil, the co uh, ease of doing business is crucial and strong, uh, stronger than we've, we've ever seen. And I, I believe it will f uh, also be addressed at certain state levels, like Sao Paulo, state and city. The Minister Rise, the governor, is uh, committing to heading in the same direction. Uh, which makes it very important because it's not just federal, it's uh, state and local as well. Yeah. Well, Sao yeah. Paulo did recently too, uh, adopt two decisions very important. One was they reduced the taxation over grocery products, mm -hmm. and the second they reduced also uh, the taxation over fuel and air fares, uh, which is very high in Brazil. So the VAT, the local <coughs> VAT, is 25 percent. So this he is reducing by 50 percent. So the decision of the governor. Governor Doria is very important to show the, the disposition of the political environment to propose a better uh, environment for investment. Mm -hmm. I think all three of you brought up some key industries where um, I'd like to dive deeper into the opportunities that exist. But before I do, I did want to bring the conversation back to the U.S. just for a second before we move on, because we all know that the United <coughs> States is actively engaging in trade negotiations now with China. Um, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement is about um, to go through Congress for approval. And so with some of these uh, high-priority trade negotiations in scope for the United States, I'm wondering, um, and this can be to Tony, but it can also be to all three of you, how does Brazil <coughs> fit into President Trump's administration, into the administration's list of priorities for trade? Yeah, and not to touch on it a little bit before in terms of the realism of thinking about a free trade agreement, something significant coming out of this visit. Uh, as your question suggests, Hinata, there's a lot on the plates both here in Washington and for that matter back home in Brasilia as well. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, negotiations with China uh, and the ratification of uh, USMCA uh, are the obvious priorities, uh, as Sonata said, uh, probably be no MOUs on uh, right. free trade uh, referencing uh, Trump's uh, correcting Lighthizer 
who said we're going to sign MOUs and no, we're going to sign agreements. Uh, well, they are agreements. Um, yeah. So um, I think even though th there's been a years long effort and interest in establishing formal free trade uh, relationship, um, it'll be a work in progress. What the thing that will make the difference is if there are uh, uh, officials in both Brasilia and Washington who are really tasked with uh, getting this together and delivering and working on the specifics. Um, uh, and I suspect that among the things that Brazil will need to do is to uh, look at Mercosul and uh, needs for some new ideas, as Ernesto Arujo said when he was here recently about uh, Mercosul. And uh, so it, the relationship there is not an impediment to um, uh, moving forward yeah. on bilateral basis. Uh, but the key thing uh, in terms of the potential now, as is, is, uh, Murillo is suggesting, there is more will on both sides, uh, or at least at the same time, than I think we've seen uh, perhaps forever. And that will at the highest levels should make a difference. So I think we can get there, but it, at, at this one there would probably be <coughs> talk of establishing an ongoing dialogue, uh, a working group or something, as opposed to s signing. Can I, can I just add, um, I think that the conversations uh, happening now between the US and China became more interesting to Brazil yesterday when China announced that they would uh, be willing to buy $30 billion of US agro products. This is quite <coughs> scary for Brazilian agribusiness because Brazil is a very top exporter to China and China is our biggest trade partner nowadays. We export we are the first world exporter of soybeans, of bovine meat, of poultry meat. Uh, and those are exactly the three sectors that China announced or, or the Trump administration announced publicly yesterday that China would be willing to buy from the US. So that became scare, a, bit, a little bit scary now for the agro sector in Brazil. And I mm -hmm. work with a lot of them, so uh, they are desperate with that announcement from yesterday. And this is important because it uh, sets a little bit of the um, I don't know the energy that's gonna bring the Brazilian Commission to the U.S. Uh, that was not uh, being considering uh, considering till now. But honestly, for those who work uh, with trade and business, we like we we didn't expect for that, but we expected that some arrangement would happen between the U.S. and China because. China is the uh, the world's biggest uh, creditor of the U.S. foreign debt. So of course, some arrangement would happen. The, both economies are really uh, intimately linked. So now it became a problem to Brazil, a real problem actually. And uh, honestly, I'm a bit um, curious, I would say, not to say something else. How the Brazilian government? How is the Brazilian government going to deal with it here in DC in March 19th? Because honestly, uh, that's uh, that's a game that I I'm not sure that Brazil knows how to play at that level. So I'm a bit I'm a bit concerned. And with regards to Mercosul, since you mentioned, um, well. Uh, Probably you know, some of you know that there is a decision from, uh, of Mercosur from 2000 that um, makes impossible to the countries of Mercosur to um, deal, to sign trade agreements, if not with, with the bloc going together. So we have now negotiations, Mercosur EU, Mercosur Korea, Mercosur Singapore, Mercosur Canada. Uh, but we don't, it's hard to have a Brazil-US negotiation if we are going to keep observing that resolution from 2000. We know that Brazil uh, was the, actually the only country of Mercosul who was holding back 
and trying to respect that, that resolution for the past years. Because Argentina with Macri, Paraguay and Uruguay, they were already willing to negotiate alone. So this is something that might have to be, that might be reviewed actually uh, within Mercosur this year if we want uh, with the new administration to negotiate alone with the US or with any other market. So well, I guess we'll have to bring you all back for another conversation in mid-March. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that you started us, us off by bringing up the agricultural sector. Yeah. Um, and you highlighted some of the challenges there uh, yeah. and what people will be kind of looking out for during the visit. Um, but I also wanted to touch on two other industries that I think will be um, topics of conversation between the two presidents. The first being um, the innovation sector technology and the second def defense and aerospace. Um, and so Murilu, to you, I'll, f I'll frame this question. I think that you mentioned this even earlier before about the time it takes to do taxes in Brazil. Well, it also takes quite a bit of time to open a business in Brazil. I think on average 90 days. Um, and this is a very onerous legal framework. The bureaucratic processes are um, impediments to opening businesses in Brazil. Um, but other than the less bureaucratic processes the president has suggested, what do you think are some other incentives that need to be put in place to foster innovation in Brazil and encourage, encourage more technology business? Uh, well, uh, we are having a boom of fintechs in Brazil and other startups, so we have a, uh, an environment for innovation uh, that are already <laughs> in course. We have initiatives like the Porto Digital in Pernambuco, which is highly successful and others, so the mentality are there, so the will are there, and we have some money to, 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 fu to fund these movements. What really we need is less uh, red tapes, and the government has uh, uh, the idea to cut half uh, the bureaucracy in Brazil. How? They are using the doing business in Brazil as a, as a map. Brazil is in 109th position as the worst place to do business in the world. I do not believe this is the reality. I think the environment is ugly, is awful, but it's not that awful. Uh, uh, they want to, to reduce or to, to put Brazil in, in the 50 or 60 position among the nations uh, uh, with a better uh, or the worst place to do business. So if they do this in one year, two years, the situation will be much better in Brazil. <laughs> and also, uh, we have to talk about corruption, because corruption is also a great impediment for investment, impairs investment in Brazil. And uh, with the attitude of society in Brazil, and also uh, uh, the, the, the Lava Jato endorsement to this government, which is very important, we have to say that, this administration is endorsed by appointment <laughs> by Lava Jato. So with Sergio Moro as a Minister of Justice there, he is a powerful sign that Brazil are against corruption, and this also will help uh, the environment for innovation in the country. So I, I see uh, <laughs> these two aspects are important. And the third aspect is the fact that Brazil faced a deep recession or low uh, economic growth in the last eight years. You know, so we are ending a horrible cycle of depression, economic depression in the country. And this also will boost the, 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 the innovation in a country. And as you know, Brazil is a country that is highly open to innovation. You know, all this Airbnb, Uber, and also other things like that are, are highly popular in the country because Brazil, Brazilians love technology. Brazilians are highly connected. We have more than 230 million telephone mobile lines in the country, mm -hmm. so more mobile lines than population. So this is something that we have to, 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 to consider as an asset for us in terms of renovation, innovation and renovation. So I see uh, as a very positive uh, environment for innovation in the future, in the near future in Brazil. No, I think we, we absolutely agree with you on that. And Brazil is, um, we also work a bit on disinformation and communication trends here. And I think the mobile first trend in Brazil is absolutely indicative of where the country is going. Um, and when we were down there last year, we got the opportunity to talk to a lot of startups and fintech uh, companies. And I think that they're optimistic as well that this will be 
um, a new era for them. Um, Tony, I wanted to pass the floor to you to talk a little bit about the defense and aerospace industries. Um, you know, you were involved in this during your tenure as ambassador. Um, the United States and Brazil have emphasized that this is an industry that they'd like to um, reach deliverables on. And so how can the United States and Brazil work more effectively together in this space? Well, I'm hoping, thank you. I'm hoping that uh, uh, one of the deliverables is uh, finally returning from, uh, to reality uh, since 2000, uh, when, uh, in the year 2000. While I was there, uh, we also signed a, the technical safeguards agreement to allow launch of satellites from the Alcantara uh, base. Um, it was thought to be uh, quite an accomplishment uh, particularly in Brazil, uh, um, but it went to the Congress and died. Um, it was uh, viewed, the safeguards arrangements which deny access to uh, some of the high technology components of launch uh, equipment and, and so forth, uh, was an invasion of sovereignty um, and thus uh, was voted down somewhat surprisingly, I think, to the administration at the time. So it's been in the works off and on since then. It's, it's received quite a bit of attention. It would be, uh, it, Alcantara is apparently almost ideal place to launch satellites and there are facilities there that can be further improved. Um, so it could be a, a source, a stimulus uh, for extensive cooperation and, and uh, investment and so forth in, in Brazil, not just by the U.S. launching, but by um, others using it more as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of the aerospace uh, sector more generally, Brazil has one of the great success stories. And again, it, ha it was the case when I was there, it's still the case and maybe uh, on a uh, ramp up, uh, and that is Embraer. Um, it uh, uh, was a demonstration of uh, an international, truly international business where planes are produced in Brazil, but parts are brought from the U.S., parts are brought from Europe and uh, combined there and then sold all over the world. Um, so it, to me, is the poster child for what businesses uh, can do in a very value-added advanced manufacturing environment. Uh, had the pleasure of visiting the, uh, the facilities there. And the new Boeing partnership uh, also uh, suggests there will be a major additional investment and probably additional marketing of the planes. Uh, hope and my, my wife always enjoy finding that we're getting onto an Embraer plane when we're <laughs> traveling. Um, so, and I agree with Murillo, uh, the Brazilian population, and particularly younger population, are very technology oriented, and it's a, basically a, an entrepreneurial culture flourishes pretty much in Brazil. So, um, if you can, uh, if some of these things can be accomplished in terms of the ease of doing business, not just for foreign and foreigners, it's as much for Brazilians, right? Um, then. Uh, I think uh, there is room for some real growth and in the innovation area, digital economy and so forth. Absolutely. I'd like to pivot the conversation now to the OECD. It's something that you all brought up as uh, a key point that will be discussed during the visit in March, um, if not the top priority. Um, for Brazil at least. Um, we know that in 2017 Brazil applied to be a member of the OECD. Um, just last week the OECD accepted Brazil's application to be a permanent member of the competition committee, which is um, one small step um, in a longer process, we know, but a positive sign. Um, but to become a full member, Brazil will need to make some significant changes, particularly to its economic and trade policies. And so, Hanata, this question is to you, um, what would some of those changes look like in the immediate term and then in the longer term? I believe uh, um, that Brazil has been doing a lot of changes and fast changes in order to become an OECD member. 
uh, Brazil is the non-member most active in the OECD. Like it sits in almost every committee of the of the organization. So it's very active. Brazil is understood that the, the OECD as uh, uh, a country to be looked at because of its economic importance. And just to highlight a few changes that are in course, and I think this government is going to continue that work, is with regards, uh, with regards to regulatory coherence, co uh, regulatory standards is something very crucial for OECD. And now, uh, Marcelo Guarinis, who is the Deputy Minister of Economy, he was the most important person in that regard in the past government, in the Temer government. He has been pushing this agenda, regulatory agenda, regulatory coherence, regulatory convergency agenda for the past two, three years uh, very strongly. And since he's still in a, in a high profile position in the government, I believe this agenda will keep uh, uh, going in this government. This is super important. Uh, I think with regard to uh, this new position that Brazil was uh, um, got into with regards to the competitive committee, it's a good sign. It's a very important sign, actually, uh, for the market as well. Uh, it, it signals that Brazil, Brazilian practice with regard to competitiveness mm -hmm. are aligned with OECD. So this is important. So the, the, the OECD stamp, uh, I think it's important for Brazil because it shows uh, that Brazil is committed with long-term reforms. So that's the most important thing with regards to the OECD. Uh, so I, my, from my perspective, uh, the Tema government has improved a lot, actually, this uh, OECD environment needs in Brazil for the past two years. And I believe Bolsonaro team is really engaged uh, in that discussion uh, now. So I think this is going to be the hot topic of the visit, actually. Kanata, you brought up the yeah. stamp of approval that accession would give to Brazil yeah. to really show that um, it's following the best international standards. Um, that's something that Minister Paulo Guedes also said. Yeah. And so, Murilo, I'd like to pose this question to you. If, on the one hand, OECD accession grants Brazil this um, seal <laughs> of approval. On the other hand, it could call for a potential give and take from the Brazilian administration. And so what does that give and take look like? And what's at stake for both Brazil and the United States as they negotiate this? Well, uh, what I, I see as more important in these regards is the fact that the culture of OCD is in Brazil. So we are willing to, com to comply. We are willing to commit to this uh, agreement and procedures. And, and that's a big change in Brazil. And, and I even being a big change, and as a big change will be not easy, because a lot of Brazilian players are not prepared to, 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 to live in an environment with more competition, uh, with new rules. So these uh, are changing uh, dramatically the landscape of the economics in Brazil as Lava Jato did uh, in one hand. You know, uh, Lava Jato uh, destroyed the Brazilian model of capitalism and created a new uh, business environment. And when we became a member of OCD, we will be exposed to rules that are not familiar for our tradition in terms of business. So it will be a kind of cultural shock mm -hmm. that we will see, so it will be not an easy uh, task. Uh, I saw some resistance uh, to the new approach of the government. Uh, I remember in the end of uh, last year how sectors of Brazilian industry were reacting to a neoliberal approach for economics. They were, uh, in certain manner, against Paulo Guedes' uh, programs. Uh, they exposed that. Uh, one of the uh, areas that were more uh, showing more resistance was the uh, uh, related to the, the Confederation of Industry of Brazil. Uh, so they, 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 they opposing some resistance to this new environment. So I believe that besides uh, the battle abroad, 
uh, the battle inside is the most important to comply and to, to reach the new situation with, uh, <coughs> in regards to this. And also, the United States will be very helpful for us because if you remember, now you do not remember because you are very young, but uh, Bush, George Bush, the father, and Collor together oh, not that young. <laughs> <laughs> created a, a, a certain uh, relationship that boosted. Uh, the modernization of yeah. Brazilian economics. So it was very important for Brazil to change, uh, to start uh, the change, to implement privatization, to end monopolies, to end prejudice towards uh, foreign capital was uh, the, the starting point was this relationship between the U.S. and Brazil. At that time, I remember uh, George Bush said uh, that uh, Collor was a kind of Indiana Jones <laughs> in <laughs> with the mission to <coughs> restore credibility. In fact, even having a short term as President Collor uh, implemented reforms that last and were more uh, profound with Cardoso and changed also, begin to change the, the economic profile of Brazil. As a follow-up to that question, you brought up how the ways that the United States has in the past supported Brazil's accession process. Um, Tony, to you, I'd like to ask, during this trip, how do you think that the U.S. will express its support for OECD membership for Brazil, and how might, more importantly, how might it position Brazil um, more broadly on the global stage and as a leader in the region? Well, it depends on whether the Lighthizer or President Trump are speaking, I think. Um, I, um, the, for us, the o OECD process of, of choosing to support and what level of support and so forth tends to involve some complexities of interagency process, uh, different uh, departments and uh, so forth weighing in and uh, needing to study it more and so forth. So uh, I think the combination of bureaucracy or processes here and uh, probably some need for some additional reforms on top of the substantial ones that have occurred will mean that it will take take uh, a little while. Uh, it's very good, I think, though, to have a clear ask for the, uh, the president and the team to b be coming forward with something very spe specific. Uh, that they're looking for because that has frequently been missing from high-level uh, dialogues in the past. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, Murillo, the anti-corruption efforts, the appointment of Judge Moro, Moro uh, as Justice Minister uh, uh, lay a very good foundation for, think for considering that Brazil is moving in the right direction and uh, should be supported. Um, I think the immediate result that it will give a confirmation that Brazil is setting new and higher aspirations for uh, the way uh, it, its economy is, is uh, and fiscal affairs are conducted. Um, in the intermediate term, it will be an impetus for uh, making such further reforms as may be desired for full membership. Uh, and in the long term, Frankly, it will make Brazil's economy a more competitive and business community a more competitive uh, factor on the uh, global business and investment uh, stage. So what's not, not to like? Uh, uh, even though, as uh, Marilla suggests, some sectors will feel a little more wedded to the more statist approach uh, to the economy that has Thank you. I have two more questions, but I wanted to flag that in about five minutes we'll open, open up to question and answer. So we'll have our interns walking around with microphones. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, um, start thinking about it now. Um, and so Tony, to follow up on your, um, on your comments, you mentioned that different industries have different stakes um, related to OECD accession. And so what are some of the opportunities that this accession would bring to the agricultural sector, for example, or um, some of the other industries that we brought up? And this question can be to all three of you. I know that accession is far away yet, but industries are already manifesting themselves. And so what, um, what do you think those opportunities are for specific sectors? Yeah, me? <laughs> okay. I think, well, I can, I can um, 
talk more on behalf of the agro sector, I believe. Uh, I think, but the agro sector in Brazil is already like the market access is something that they know how to do. The, the, the policy on market access, they know how to do for a long time. They're very uh, prepared for this. Mm -hmm. So I think that on this um, and also um, something that came up on discussion, uh, you were involved also, Roberta, uh, this past week is on subsidies. Is if Brazil uh, would have to lower its subsidies uh, in order to enter the OECD, but in reality, the, the agro subsidies in Brazil are very low. If you compare to the US, to Japan, to the European Union, which are already members of the OECD. So, and also Murilo mentioned that the red tape with regards to the agro sector is already pretty much like, uh, or at least mapped. If not solved, it's mapped. They know what it they have addressed. to do. Exactly, yeah. it, it was addressed. Uh, but with regards to, uh, if you think about um, industry, as a whole, or uh, infrastructure, for example, I think entering the OECD as a, it, it obliges Brazil and the industry to commit with uh, with uh, enhancing the environment. If you think about ports, highways, airports, and I think, uh, as I mentioned before, we have a minister of infrastructure who is committed to, to, to open to, to, internet, to uh, foreign investors. And so I think they are aligned. I think it's the sector, if you think not, if you don't think accepting the agro sector, if you think uh, on the rest of the Brazilian industry, then I think we're gonna see changes and they will have to commit to ch changes in order to adhere and to be a full member of the OECD. I think we have to, to and I think, I believe the private sector is really willing to uh, commit with that. If you, s if you saw the discussions last year at the CNI, for example, you see a loud voice from the private sector willing that Brazil <laughs> commits, so they, c they have a, a reason also to complain about the changes, so it's, it's a game, 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 I believe. Do you have anything to add, Murilo, to that? No, I think that uh, yeah. just a, a word. Uh, Brazil has a lot of opportunities, regardless if we will be member soon of OCD. Uh, we have opportunities in the infrastructure, concessions, PPP, sports, railways, roads. Uh, Brazil is a country that is necessary to invest heavily in infrastructure, and now the rules are fair, the, the, the programs are transparent, uh, the rules are clear. So it, we did this in the oil sector, and the result was a boom of investments in the pre-sal uh, for the next year. So uh, I believe regardless the, the, the adherence of Brazil mm -hmm. or the timing of this adherence, uh, the investors abroad uh, uh, must understand that Brazil is a place to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the reserves. We have $400 billion in reserves. We have more than $100 billion in treasures from the U.S., so we are not a big client like China, but we are uh, relevant for, for, for the f to finance the debt of the United States. So we, we, we are a place that are uh, committed to, to have a better environment for investments. We have a lot of opportunities. Uh, we have a desire uh, uh, to consume. Brazilians is a country of consumers. So if we have money, we will buy. So we have the will to move the economy. So this is something that uh, who are there in Brazil for a long time knows that. And yeah. also what I see as a very important sign is, is to end the banking concentration of Brazil. So this other opportunity we have is to open the, the financial system for new players. The fintechs will provide also opportunities for that, but we need to have money more cheap in Brazil. A cheaper money will boost also economics. So the opportunities for those who have more than half an hour to read about and study about Brazil mm -hmm. uh, are very, very evident. Yeah. I think you may just have answered my last question, but I'll pose okay, it so anyway, <laughs> um, which is if you could all leave our audience members with one key issue or opportunity to watch both from the bilateral trip that's coming up um, or uh, as a way that the relationship might be strengthened, what would that be? Tony, we can start with you. Um, I guess my suggestion would be learn to play golf. <laughs> uh, um, no, seriously, two words, pension reform. Uh, 
it, it, you know, forgetting the back and forth on the bilateral, nothing would have more impact for not just uh, the soundness of Brazil's financial platform, but confidence of investors around the world and to see something very significant uh, in the way, finally, of pension reform. I think, uh, so much, I forget how much of the, G, of the uh, federal budget is composed of these payments, but, and they're growing and uh, aging population. It's almost a, uh, a life or death issue to be addressed. Absolutely. Tenata? Well, I think adding to learning how to play golf, I would advise not to mention MOU <laughs> in <Right>. the visit. <laughs> uh, but I think I agree, the pension reform is something that has to pass this year, otherwise the market is going to lose confidence. Uh, this is a big deal for Brazil this year. Uh, I think that Brazil, has, uh, that Brazil is a super huge domestic consumer market, super attractive to investors. This is important also. Uh, but I also believe that uh, the market and the investor would have to have a little patience with the reforms, with uh, the pace of everything, how everything is, is going to happen in Brazil. Because one thing that I, I, I believe is we didn't mention, but it's something important from my perspective, is that we have a lot of new people in Brasilia that were never in Brasilia before. And it, Brasilia is something special. Learning how to work in Brasilia is something special. I have a lot of yeah. friends here and colleagues who know what I'm talking about. So I think they that Brazilian, the Brazilian government first has to uh, organize internally themselves. And then we are going to see, hopefully, uh, the changes the market <coughs> is expect, expe expecting and uh, above all the pension reform for this year and tax reform next year, maybe. Great. Murilo, the last yeah. word goes to you. The last word. It's <laughs> many words. First of all, U.S. must understand that Brazil is a country of a lot of opportunities. Ideologically, we are aligned in the same direction. Uh, Brazil trusts in Brazil. 80% of our internal debt is financed by Brazilians, so it's something very, very important. Uh, so we are not we are not going to do reforms. We are making reforms. We are doing reforms already. So we are not promising that we will do. It's not uh, an Argentinian approach for life, you know, that we promise and one day. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell our know. deputy director that you said <laughs> that. <one day. laughs> As every 10 years you see what's going on in Argentina, mobs and devaluation. I like to say that some years ago in 98, one dollar was one real, was one peso. So today, when you look, uh, one dollar is four reais, more or less, and 38 pesos. So that's the story of the failure yeah. of uh, a, a culture, a financial culture. So the proof <laughs> is evident. Brazil is very different. And, and you, as investors uh, and partners, uh, must understand that. So my, my, my last word is study a little bit more about Brazil. You're going to find nice surprises. Great. I think that was a controversial last word for our Argentine <laughs> colleague. No, no, I, like I love Argentina. I love Argentina. But we are doing better in football also because we won well, five times. <laughs> and in economics. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, it it does, that. and we have Pelé, <laughs> much better than Maradona. Uh, <laughs> so they're gonna kill me now. I think we could have an entire panel discussion about that. One. <laughs> no, it no, does no. suggest, though, uh, looking at Argentina, uh, some patience is required. Yeah. Uh, not, it, it, yeah, Absolutely. it's not going to happen. <laughs> no. over. I think with that, I'd like to open a Q and A. Um, I see three hands. We'll start in the gray sweatshirt in the back. And please state your name if you could. Sure. Um, Isabel Hoagland with Inside US Trade. Thanks for being here today. Um, two questions. Ambassador, you mentioned some things Brazil needs to do before an FTA with the US comes to fruition. Um, can you elaborate on some of those items? And just building off of that, what are some concessions you think the US could ask for in exchange for supporting its OECD bid? Um, we saw what happened with Colombia's OECD process and the US demands on IP and trucking. 
Is that a concern at all, um, that the OECD could be used as a platform for negotiating leverage? Uh, on OECD, first, I'm not an expert on OECD, uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't see it so much as one of the U.S. using leverage uh, to uh, accomplish things in the relationship we're back in Brazil, uh, because as, as we're suggesting, I think the, there's an unusual degree of alignment culturally and ide ideologically. It's hard, and I'm sure many of you experience the same thing. You don't. F it's hard to find any American who's been to Brazil who doesn't love Brazilians, and Brazilians uh, pretty generous in their affection for Americans as well. Um, the uh, so I don't think the the impediments to reaching a free trade agreement with Brazil will be nearly as substantial as in other situations, and obviously the. the primary example, the overwhelming example, is U.S.-China, or one might say China and uh, most of the rest of the world. Uh, under the WTO framework, uh, I was at a luncheon with trade experts at the Brazilian um, embassy residence not long ago, and the strong consensus was that uh, WTO and uh, China's accession to WTO was papering over uh, dramatic differences um, and that now the Europeans and the uh, Japan, Korea, U.S., et cetera, need to come together with a common view and, uh, and essentially uh, together could cause reforms like transparency and uh, anti-subsidy, intellectual property, and so forth. <coughs> um, but as Minister Arujo said when he's here, when he talks to the Europeans, they say they're uh, um, moving in their own way away from the U.S. positions and so forth. So uh, we don't have that kind of uh, alliance. And sorry, I'm going to China rather than Brazil here, but um, um, I, I think uh, there will not be that significant impediments. In each country you will have some sectors, uh, and in the agriculture sectors we have our interest. Uh, uh, we want to sell to the same places that the Brazilians want to sell, and uh, as uh, Hanata mentioned, the Chinese uh, concession on buying more from the U.S. could be a bit of a complication. Uh, C and I some concerns and so forth. Um, so I don't see a lot of specifics to worry about. Uh, I just think it requires uh, a higher priority attention and specific officials charged with getting it done. Uh, any other sure. Just something I'd like to add. I think uh, from, from what I have followed from with regard to the OECD accession, there is not a rejection from the U.S. government. There are concerns, of course. Uh, Brazil has a lot of change to do, but the biggest rejection, if you'd like to say like that, is comes from the private sector in the U.S. actually, from, from specifically from the pharmaceutical industry, from what I know. So they are lobbying strongly against Brazilian membership at the OECD. So this is something to keep in mind. I think there is not a rejection per se from the U.S. government, <coughs> but there are concerns like uh, with the that section of any new member of the OECD, and we experienced that with Colombia session, for example. So. All right. Any uh, other questions? We have. I'll take both of your questions actually, um, and then we'll let them answer. Go ahead. Thank you, Lucas Queiroz Pires. I'm international trade attorney at Alstom and Byrne. I have a question about the cooperation in the defense sector that Ambassador Harrington mentioned between Brazil and the U.S. The uh, U.S. currently has uh, sanctions against Venezuela. It recently designated PDVSA, the big oil company, as an SDN. 
And in the recent meeting in Lima, Mike Pence even invited trade allies to freeze assets of Venezuela and oil companies. So considering that historically Brazil has the approach of imposing multilateral sanctions following UN guidelines and not unilateral, uh, do you see a potential change in this approach from Brazil uh, in order to cooperate more with the US in the defense sector? Thank you. Um, other questions? Yeah, uh, so my name is Daniel Alano. Um, I was about to say that before the last question that is a sign of uh, the times that we didn't mention WTO once in a discussion about trade. Um, and, uh, but I think my, my question remains, which is, um, you know, Brazil and, and the US have always been great uh, players in the WTO, in the multilateral agreements, and uh, have always tried to use uh, the system, not only to their advantage, but to pose a ruling system for trade. And this conversation has been, you know, especially in Brazil, and with now Bolsonaro and Trump, uh, WTO has been a, not actually a point of emphasis in both administrations. So my question is that, do you, to the to, to all of you, is do you think that that might change, or um, maybe perhaps uh, both countries would use that system to try to do something different with the WTO, or what 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 would be for both administrations the future of the WTO in that sense of of the trading regime? Thank you both. We'll start with the Venezuela question. Um, and Tony, if you'd like to start or hand off. Right. Um, well, as your question suggests, uh, my experience is that Brazil has historically taken, taken a non-interventionist approach. If it's going to be uh, acting, it would act multilaterally through the UN or other uh, fora, um, OAS perhaps. Um, but uh, I think with this administration, it has definitely dialed, changed the dial on that. And as a matter of fact, when Minister Arrujo was here for a dinner not too long ago, um, he uh, pretty much specifically said that uh, under the Bolsonaro administration, uh, the uh, Brazil is going to be much more active and direct in on the world stage and very pro-democracy, uh, that uh, you know, fundamental platform of being pro-democracy. So uh, the, their uh, outspokenness and leadership in the Lima group of countries, uh, uh, I think is, is, I think he referred to it as a test case uh, for the new policy and, and ability to uh, st stimulate others in the region of like mind to resist the uh, unfortunate conditions and undemocratic conditions that exist in Venezuela. And on Venezuela, if you are interested in more, we do have a very robust program, so I feel like I have to sell that a little here, but keep an eye on our website because we're doing a lot on Venezuela right now. Um, and now pivoting to the WTO question, Hinata or Murilo. Oh my God, really? We should <laughs> have another <laughs> panel on that. You're a trade expert. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Danielle, well, we didn't mention the WTO here because I think it deserves a special panel actually. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, earlier this week at the World Bank watching Joseph Stiglitz and he said that all the questions are wrong uh, with regards to the WTO because multilateralism is the only road to development if you think about development. So I think that Brazil, uh, Brazil has, is a big player at the WTO, has been historically. I think it has a great chance of taking the lead of the discussion this year. We are chairing a lot, uh, several committees at the WTO. So I think we have, we have a robust group of people. Of course, the secretariat uh, doesn't count as uh, nationals. But we have a, a, a robust of people at Itamaraty that are willing to advocate on behalf of the multilateralism and of the WTO. Uh, I think our current minist ministry of uh, foreign affairs has is not that aligned with uh, Itamaraty as a whole on that. Uh, but may I think he will face pressure. Uh, a lot of internal pressure, actually. In Brazil has, has um, 
the chance of taking the lead of, on many issues. I think with regards to the, to the US, the complaints the US has been presenting, they are not new. They, 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 since the Obama government, you're, for example, Jennifer Hilma, uh, who was uh, the appellate body judge, she was the first one who was not reappointed by the US government, and that was not Trump. So the crisis we see at the appellate body uh, like, has, been, has been happening for years. I think the appellate body, as we know today, it's ended, unfortunately. Uh, I've heard uh, extra officially from uh, people from the USTR uh, that uh, the, 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 the background of everything is that the US rejects uh, WTO pres precedent. Uh, so they are trying to push back to GATT period to be more diplomatic uh, and not a rules-based system so much with regards to precedent and WTO decisions. But I even if you go back to GATT, that doesn't mean you won't have precedent if you consider what we have today as precedent, even though WTO law doesn't mention precedent. So I think this is a big discussion. I think many of the complaints the US is bringing uh, are important. And they, they might be viewed as a, an opportunity inside the <coughs> WTO to review um, several procedures which are not working for today's world, as uh, they were very successful 20, 30 years ago, but now we, we need to review. The only ag um, uh, agreement we have uh, since the WTO was es established, the multilateral one, is the, the trade facilitation agreement. You know that. So we didn't have many uh, robust approvements of agreements, multilateral agreements, um, since 1995. Uh, but I think we can look at that as a, uh, at all that is happening now as an opportunity. Lighthizer knows a lot of WTO. He's somebody very knowledgeable on WTO. So maybe we can look at this an, as an opportunity. I think the US is the biggest gainer from the WTO. So honestly, I don't believe that they are going to simply leave the organization. Hopefully not, I don't know, maybe Trump, because Trump and Lighthizer, they don't agree on an MOU, so I don't know what can <laughs> happen. If yeah, I believe in Lighthizer in that sense. So. Uh, but I think we can look at this as an opportunity. I think Brazil and the US could work together on that, actually. Uh, I think Brazil is willing to align with the US in many senses, and that is one of them. So maybe. Well, I think that's all the time we have today, yeah. but I wanted to thank you all so much for coming and to thank our speakers, um, some of whom came from very far away. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.